have here the report of the Constitution Review Commission. And on page 224, the commission reports that it was inundated by the good people of Ghana to look at this matter. And in its final conclusion, it makes this recommendation in paragraph 107 that, quote, the commission recommends that Article 1281 be amended to provide for a maximum of 15 justices of the Supreme Court. The clause in the Constitution that sets the maximum number of justices should, however, remain a non-entrenched clause so that Parliament may, by a two-thirds majority, amend the Constitution to increase or reduce the number, unquote. Do you share this view that it is time for a capping of the justices of the Supreme Court? Once the law is changed, we can go along with it. It has, it, it, in, indeed, in, you know, in, in all my years at the Supreme Court, I don't think we have ever been, uh, once for a very brief while we were about 15, but we have not. And, and, the, and the Supreme Court itself is not configured, the, physically, it's not configured for any huge numbers. I don't know, but at the moment, there is no cap, and if uh, more people are poured in, one will have to manage. But if the law, if the, uh, there's an amendment, I don't think I or the judiciary will have any objection to it. Please, link to that is the issue of empaneling. Uh, some hold a view that on constitutional cases, there should be a full empaneling. Uh, and uh, so that even if there's a review, the same number of uh, justices are made to hear uh, that case. Uh, is it a view you share um, as uh, we discuss uh, judi judicial reforms and building confidence in uh, the apex court? I think it's under the courts, under the Supreme Court rules that they set the rules that actually govern uh, review. And there it provides that it's uh, it, an additional two will be added. So if, if the If there's the perceived need to insist on full empaneling, then the law will need to be changed. Um, there's still a downside to doing that. If you've noticed, no constitutional case ever sits less than seven judges. And that creates the opportunity for the panel to be enhanced to nine. In fact, I have even sat on, on, on some cases, constitutional cases, where we start even off as nine, and then two more can be added under review. Because even though the review power is there, it, 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 I think it is also um, it is also en en encouraging and comforting that in a review process there will be actually four four new eyes, <laughs> to, or rather, or two pairs of new eyes to come and look at the case so as to, to enhance the, 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 the final outcome. I, I think it's it, the idea of sitting the whole court on bank right from the beginning, apart from being most likely rather cumbersome if it's a, a 12 or if it's an 11, or, or, or 13 or 15 court. Apart from that, there is still also the, the psychological impact 
I think there's, it, there's a, a more positive psychological impact in, in adding two more people who come to the case with a fresh mind. The final question, my lord, has to do with the response you gave earlier to the Montier case. You did indicate that the judiciary was forced to intervene because, in your words, weeks had passed and you did not see action from the Attorney General's Department. There are some lawyers who hold a view that the Judicial Secretary could have, if there was that suspicion that there would be no action from the Attorney General's Department, the Judicial Secretary, for example, could have been made to write to the Attorney General uh, to commence action. Linked to that as well, it's a current case which many consider to be an even more uh, egregious uh, attack on the judiciary. Uh, we do know that the Nolly Prosequi has been filed. In that same philosophy, are we therefore to envisage that if you do not see action from the Attorney General's Department, the judiciary will move in again and take over this matter, as you did in the Munti case? Cannot, taking the last part of your, of your question, I cannot uh, comment on something that has not happened. I, I, I don't think it is right to do so. So uh, the, the other aspect is, could the uh, judicial secretary not have written to the Attorney General, frankly, I'm not in a position to know whether or not, in fact, he did write and there was no action. I cannot say anything about that, because I don't know. Let me start with uh, judicial reforms. I believe so much work has been done in that area with uh, the introduction of uh, case management conferences with um, uh, witness statements, etc. These are all in a bid to uh, facilitate uh, speedy trials. Would you consider further reforms to forcefully uh, admit evidence electronically obtained? And further, whether you also consider the uh, electronic storage of records and uh, to facilitate a quicker retrieval? Yes, why not? Anything to, one, uh, preserve the integrity of records and also to speed up the, the uh, litigation process is within the, should be within the realms of possibility. And the, the beauty of it is that at this particular moment in time, there are so many jurisdictions, as I've said earlier on, which are at various stages of um, uh, in mainstreaming technology in the way things are, are done. And uh, over the years, I've had the opportunity to observe quite a number of them. One of the best that I've, I observed was um, uh, one that was designed and is still uh, managed by one of the justices of the Supreme Court of Algeria. And this is in Algeria. And Algeria is a huge country. But it is possible to do um, cases without ev the person ever, the parties ever being in, in, in one place at the same time, but by the use, by the optimal use of uh, a very strong satellite backbone that they have. You can be in the middle of the desert and use your, your phone to, to 
to, to do what you need to do. And, uh, and Mexico is another country that also has a very good system like that. And, and some of the systems in, in the third world are even better and more advanced than even in the, in the Western world. So it, it's not, it's not uh, even uh, a, a, a rocket science anymore. So all avenues, as for judicial reforms, I think uh, when it comes to reforms, reforms are onwards and upwards. Any, in any in any viable or quality institution. That should be the principle. The nominee from her CV has a very uh, long period of experience on the African Human Rights and People's Court. I just want to know what lessons uh, she want to consider to enrich our law reforms and human rights records, particularly in the areas of uh, child labor child trafficking offenses? At the moment, the African Court on Human and People's Rights has, has jurisdiction only in matters against states, not individuals. Uh, in the instrument I'm talking about, it's, a, it's an, another protocol. It then gives criminal uh, jurisdiction. And in that case, individuals can also be brought there. But where it's, uh, it's private individuals, I think there's the principle of um, exhausting room, uh, local remedies still apply. And so, but in terms of uh, general rights, I think that, yes, child labor and, uh, and offenses against children is an area where the the, the, the state, the country needs to be looking very seriously at. I think we need to even uh, properly formalize the definition of what amounts to child labor. When does uh, uh, helping somebody's child and in return that child uh, helps you with your domestic services, when does it cross? the line, and so on and so forth. It's a debate that's going on, and Ghana needs to take a, a firm stand on, on, on where, where, where we are in, in, in all matters concerning, uh, concerning the child, because the child, that's our future. With your permission, I want to quote from the Constitution, Article 125.3, which says that the judicial power of Ghana shall be vested in the judiciary accordingly neither the president nor parliament nor any organ or agency of the president or parliament shall have or be given final judicial power. In the same constitution, Article 72 brings us face to face with the pardoning power of the president or the prerogative of mercy. So the judiciary does its work and the president exercises this power to sort of free people who have been convicted by the judiciary, does it not in any way take away the final judicial power of the judiciary? Okay. This matter is also sub judice, so we, I cannot speak to it. I'm also interested in how independent you are having re regards to the legislature and the executives. For example, a number of times judges have made pronouncements that have become more or less like a law. And I think like taking the legislative role. Other times, some judges have been called to serve, apart from the constitutional mandatory committees where it is specifically stated that a justices of either an appeal or high court or Supreme Court to chair. There are times that they've also been called upon to chair one committee or other within the executives. How do you just oppose these examples that have given with the independent of the judiciary? Regarding the law-making uh, powers of the, of the judiciary, let me put it that way. Uh, that is an 
in, 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 in innate part of the judicial process. We, we have the power to declare what is law and what is not, what is lawful and what is not lawful. Uh, the Constitution also gives us the power to declare whether uh, something Parliament has done, it has done lawfully or it has not done lawfully. That's, that's how our uh, Constitution has structured the work of the judiciary. Um, uh, we, it, it is not our desire to interfere with anybody's power, but uh, when we have the capacity and the competence to to uh, give directions or to 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 uphold or or not something that the the uh, legislature has done, we just have to make sure that we are acting within the parameters of the provisions of the Constitution. Um, on judges serving on executive commissions outside the sort of bodies that uh, are set out in the, in the Constitution. Um, I think that to some extent, that is also sub judice because there is a, a case pending before the Supreme Court challenging uh, a certain, uh, estab the establishment of a certain commission and the work of the commission. And, and I would rather uh, we pass, I pass on that. In the Supreme Court against Samuel the Supreme Court decided in a certain way. It came to Atubiga virtually under the same kind of up front to the court. The court did rule in a certain way. The same court came with Sir John and it went in a certain way. And then it came to the Muntier 3, it also went in a certain way. With what you've just explained about the value of precedent, how will the lower court, having seen the Supreme Court giving judgment virtually about the same kind of affront to the court differently, how would the lower court in your view, be able to pick? Which of them are they going to pick as president? Um, thank you very much, Honorable Member. Honorable Chair, um, this question, uh, with all due respect, mixes up a number of elements. It mixes up judgment, it mixes up sentencing, it mixes up uh, discretion. Discretion, there's the judgment and then there's the sentencing. In sentencing, there's discretion. This, when, ex, when discretion is exercised, it doesn't establish precedence in any particular way. Discretion is exercised, and it, but once again, um, I'm, not, I'm not borrowing anybody's words. We use these words frequently in the work that we do. Uh, uh, discretion is supposed to be exercised judicially, not whimsically or capriciously. And so uh, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on a whole load of factors when discretion is being exercised. And discretion does not establish uh, precedent, no. You can be persuaded, you can be guided by a comparison of the, of the circumstances. Because circumstances vary. Strictly speaking, there are hardly any two cases that have the same 
or identical circumstances. In the decision of the GBA versus the Attorney General, in interpreting the word advice not to be a binding, um, not to be binding, and that seemed to be contradicting or contrary to many of the interpretations that has been given in many of the Commonwealth countries. Would that mean that in the Constitution where the word advice has been used, if it's not binding, then it's, it's a waste of um, uh, 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 national resources because at the end of the day, that advisory body is, is just ceremonial. And a typical example is Article 91 of the Constitution, which states, the Council of States shall consider and advise the President or any other authority in respect of any appointment which is required by this Constitution or any other law to be made in accordance with the advice of or in consultation with the Council of States. I want to know your take on the decision um, in the matter of GBA versus the Attorney General. It's a decision the court has delivered, and uh, I cannot uh, uh, comment on it one way or the other. It's, a, it's the decision that the court took. But if I recall uh, what the it, the, there was a, a, a caveat attached to that uh, interpretation, which was that if the advice is not taken, then the matter will have to go back to the, uh, the, the it, 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 because it had to do with a list of whether there was a list of names. If none, none of the people on that list is selected, the, the president cannot bring their own person and put them there. It, the, the names will have to go back. The, the matter has to go back to the uh, Judicial Council, I believe that's what it was. And then the Judicial Council will have to come up with fresh names. I, that's my what I particularly also remember from that case, because the 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 those the cases from the other parts of the Commonwealth they were considered, but you will also realize that not all the Commonwealth countries also give that kind of meaning to advice advice has been variously interpreted. It's a matter of interpretation, and it can only vary. I had the privilege to sit by you quietly at the Thanksgiving service of outgoing Chief Justice, her leadership. I'm sure Justice Pokwa Champon will tell you that I had a license to address her as Ma CJ, my mother, the Chief Justice of Ghana. And in the church, were whispers of stop cutting our budget, stop cutting our budget, maybe directed at the executive or the legislative arm of government, pursuant to Article 179, where the judicial represents its budget. Justify why you don't want budget cuts and tie it with your principle of reforms of the judiciary to improve the administration of justice. Why don't you want budget cuts? And what do you want the money for? the budget has been prepared on all the requisite sound principles and uh, it's based on and, and, the, and the budget would be based on plans and programs that the, uh, the, the judiciary wishes to roll out and of course then uh, headcount and so on and so forth. Um, Many of the, in the past, a lot of the cuts to budget have resulted in, in uh, the 
digestive delivery system having to do without a whole load of things. From time to time, we may be able to use the internally generated funds to come up with uh, the remedial actions and so on and so forth. But I, I, I believe that um, quality justice Quality justice does not come necessarily cheap, but at the end of the line, it is value for money because you end up with um, a more satisfied populace. You cannot be, you, budget cuts are, uh, half the time, the budget cuts are simply because there's no money, and that is the reason. But the point is, from the point of view of the judiciary, it is also because we need the money to be able to do the work that we have to do. It's, it's, it's just as bad as uh, um, putting cap on human resource recruitment, which sometimes it's simply because it is it has been put there not because we don't need more judges or we don't need more graduates into the system. Now, examination as mode for selecting uh, the practice used to be to the bar, competent persons in the bar facilitated through the Judicial Council working in determining who became a judge. Now we have a process where it has to go through an examination. Where do you stand in this world? You believe that it should be examination or working with the Ghana Bar Association to determine competence across the country? Where would you, which of these schools of thought do you belong to? I have not yet joined any school of thought <laughs> on the matter, but it's, it, uh, it's, it, it is, it's, it's always possible to establish standards. It, it, when you've established standards and when you've established criteria and you've put in the mechanisms for assuring that in the application of those standards and criteria there will be the requisite objectivity and so on and so forth, then you can, you can move with it. So there will still be a bit of study to be, to be done, but it should not be a very complicated study. Still, court judges sit as additional high court judges. And you have many instances where it takes five years, sometimes eight years, for a case to be dispensed of at the court of appeal. The popular notion has been justice delayed is justice denied. What will you do to honor this embrace? embrace so that we don't have justice delayed as justice denied. If at the Court of Appeal you have five years to you have five years to eight years at the Court of Appeal and then you have appeal court judges sitting as additional high court uh, judges. I still think that five years of a dependency of uh, an appeal case that's that's quite excessive that if, if that is what is happening, it has to be looked into. I also pointed out that many times the delay is also not at the instance of the court itself, but of the parties. Of course, there are some provisions of the procedural rules which enable the registrar to certify cases that are inordinately delayed so that they can be struck out for want of prosecution. Maybe those uh, provisions m need to be utilized more. But um, Court of Appeal judges sitting as High Court judges may not necessarily be the cause of the delays that the Honorable Member is talking about, but it can be looked into because uh, ideally everyone really ought to sit in their court. And sometimes when the court of appeal judges, a court of appeal judge would sit in the high court, sometimes it may also depend on the 
magnitude of the matter that is before the High Court. Your twin brother, Justice Atuga, you said 1995 was sworn in. So who is most senior? Even though you are all sworn in the same, but who is most senior? Justice Atuga has seniority over me because instead of um, continuing straight from the fourth year, as we used to call it, of, of law school to, to the fifth year, which is the professional course year, uh, or rather the final part of the professional course, I broke and went to do my master's. So when I came back, they had already been, my, my first classmates had already been called to the bar. So I was called to the bar with, uh, the, with, with uh, Atudazi and that younger generation. <laughs> Those young ones. <laughs> I belong to the school of thought which thinks that justices of the Superior Court, in particular the Chief Justice, must be at all times above Ghana's petty, petty partisan politics. And therefore, you do have the support of the country behind you to administer justice in a manner that is fair, as you've done before. And we trust that judicial administration will not suffer in your hands. My particular concern has been that there's some justification by judges and sometimes lawyers to say that the tortuous and cumbersome nature of our judicial process must be because that is the way it should be. We trust that you take some definite uh, steps to reform in order that it can improve our democratic delivery and in particular uh, improve what you have long strived for, respect for the rule of law and fundamental human rights. I wish you well. Thank you.